Morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 13th of November and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 16th of November and it's been a fairly impressive week for European stock markets. Um, we got off to a really good start on the Monday and it was really building on the gains of the week before. The FTSE 100 for example managed to post eight successive days of gains um, and we'll look at that in a minute we'll look at the performance of the DAX, the Nikkei, um, which hit its highest levels in nearly 30, 30 years. And more broadly, um, more broad look at um look at the outlook um for markets going forward after what looks as if it could well be an impressive week of gains. Before we get started, do a little bit of um uh, bookkeeping with respect to risk warnings and disclaimers. Uh, allow allow you to digest um, to, to to digest these before before we get cracking on um, the actual agenda for the upcoming week, but also looking back at the events of the last few days. So we'll start with the Nikkei 225. Broke towards the upside on the Monday on the back of that really promising news of a vaccine candidate from Pfizer and BioNTech, 90% um, efficacy, very impressive. Um, certainly I think um, makes the outlook for treating or inoculating against coronavirus that much more positive than it was a week ago. Um, but to see the way the markets have reacted to this news, you'd think they've discovered a um, a cure for cancer. They haven't. What they've done, obviously, is there is a very promising vaccine candidate that on a limited numbers, a limited number of trials appears to have had a 90% effectiveness in preventing COVID-19. Um, obviously, there are other candidates as well. But as with anything, I think when it comes to these sorts of stories, the while the while the headline is very very positive the reality of delivering it is somewhat different and we're having to deal with the here and now and having rallied for eight days in a row as we come to the end of the week it was perhaps inevitable that we'd start to see a bit of a pullback in european stock markets and certainly if we look at the the dax that's certainly what we are seeing bit of a pullback yesterday bit of a consolidation today and if we look at the look at where we were on Friday last week, we were around about 12,500. So we popped back above 13,000. Um, the big question is, can we maintain that? What I think is particularly significant about this particular move is it brought us back all the way from that very, very key support level that I identified in the previous week of 11,360. But what it hasn't done is it hasn't pushed us back above the previous peaks. And I think that is significant because I think ultimately, while this vaccine story is very good news, it doesn't change the situation on the ground here right now. And at the moment, particularly in the last 24 hours, what we've seen is that um, in France, the number of people requiring hospitalization has risen to a record level. Here in the UK, the number of people infected in a single day surged by nearly 50 percent to over 33,000 now those numbers could come down when the numbers get released later today um, but also in the US the situation is no less serious New York City is potentially looking at the possible closure of its schools while the mayor of Chicago Lori Lightfoot announced a stay-at-home advisory for all Chicago residents for a period of 30 days which essentially means that she's asking everyone to cancel their Thanksgiving plans and stay at home, other than to go to work, go to school, or go out for supplies, food shopping, and other essentials. So that gives you an indication of where we are now. And a vaccine is not going to help with that. And ultimately, when you actually look at the ability to roll out these vaccines, the UK has bought 40 million doses. Well, that's enough for 20 million people um, because you need two doses, then they need to be three weeks apart. Um, 
And then, of course, you don't really know whether or not there are any significant long term side effects. If there are, and if there aren't, how long does the vaccine actually last for? How long after the two shots do you retain immunity? Is it three months? Is it six months? Or do you have to have, 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 to have injections every year? So there are an awful lot of unanswered questions. And I think for the here and now, it's an absolutely really positive news story. Absolutely. And it will affect, potentially, it will affect what happens in the first half of next year. It doesn't change anything now. And at the moment, France, the UK, Germany are in various states of lockdown, likely to remain so. And there is a risk, there is a significant risk that the expiry of these lockdown measures, which are due to happen at the end of this month, early next month, could get extended by a week or so. And I think there is a risk that that could happen rather than run the risk of having a spike in infection rates in the week leading up to or including Christmas. I think there is a, you know, I think there is a significant chance that these lockdown measures, these limited lockdown measures as they are, could get extended beyond the beginning of December, maybe for another seven to 10 days so that the infection rate can come down significantly enough that we can then go out and hopefully enjoy some form of Christmas break where we're not locked down. The big concern at the moment is when the lockdown restrictions get relaxed, everyone goes out, interacts with each other, and the infection rates spike again two, three, four weeks down the line. And that is the, that is the line that governments are trying to navigate at the moment. So. When I look at these charts here, DAX still remains very much range bound um, with decent resistance up around 13 and a half thousand. So I think for further gains there, we really need to see some significant evidence of a breakthrough. This bearish candle here does suggest there is a little bit of a barrier around about 13,200. So I think it really depends on how price action, how prices react when we get back above 13,200 because for the past four to five months, we've really struggled in and around that area. If we look at the S&P 500, the, Friday, the, the Monday price action was much more significant and notable. We did make a new record high, but look at where we closed. We weren't able to sustain any of those moves. And even though we did try and retest the 3,600 level, we weren't able to get back above it. So. It's going to be very, very important in terms of the DAX, in terms of the S&P 500, how we react in the event we're able to get above 3,600. And I've said this all the time, particularly when it comes to Dow theory. If the DAX breaks higher, I want to see the S&P 500 break higher. Yes, we've seen the Nikkei break higher and make new 30-year highs. And certainly there is a significant and it's made significant progress in that regard. But ultimately, that hasn't been matched by the price action in the S&P and the DAX. And what's particularly notable is how the NASDAQ has behaved. We weren't able to retake the peaks of the summer. And what is even more interesting is even though we made a new high, we actually closed on the lows of the day, suggesting that maybe we've seen the peak in the NASDAQ and that we could well be we could be well overdue a significant correction in tech stocks. So keep an eye on that level there. But certainly that that bearish candle on the Monday, in spite of the vaccine news, tells us that potentially we could well have seen a short term peak in the Nasdaq, even if we don't see it in, say, for example, the S and P and the DAX. But the fact that we haven't as yet broken those key resistance levels is a warning sign to me not to get overly bullish when it comes to looking at equity markets. One plus point is that the, the, the FTSE 100 has broken out of my long sideways downward channel, which is very, very positive news and has gone back to retest 6,400. Now, don't hang out the bunting quite yet. Yes, we've broken to the upside and we've broken above the 200 day moving average. But let's just not also forget that 
the, 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 the FTSE 100 has a very decent proportion of cyclical stocks and it. it's got airlines in it, it's got travel in it, it's got oil majors in it, it's got banks in it. And what we saw as a result of the vaccine was, or the vaccine news was growth, growth potential for 2021 could potentially be quite a bit higher, which means that potentially for the here and now, while the short-term health the situation is deteriorating in the longer term, might capacity sooner rather than later. Airlines have taken an absolute battering in the past few weeks, largely on the basis that they've had to revise down their passenger capacity um, from around about 50% of the levels that we saw last year to around about 20 to 30% as we head into the year end. This vaccine news is likely to see those capacity constraints rise, lifted upwards. That's why you've seen a bit of a decent rebound, particularly in airlines, particularly in travel stocks, and particularly in the oil majors as well, because if airlines are able to lift their capacity sooner rather than later, then obviously energy demand will go up, which will bode well for the global economy. That's why you've seen the rebound um, more pronounced in the FTSE 100, because when you extrapolate the potential for a vaccine out into the future, then the economic activity in the future could actually be fairly significantly higher than was the case about a week or so ago. So we've seen a bit of a breakout in the FTSE 100. And while the DAX has managed to recover all of its losses year to date, if we look at the FTSE 100, we can see that we're still well below the levels that we were at the beginning of the year. So FTSE 100 has significantly underperformed, which means it has the potential to rebound an awful lot more than say, for example, its European counterparts. So on a, on a valuation basis, FTSE 100 stocks are much, much cheaper. Now, obviously Brexit is one part of the reason for that, the UK EU trade talks. They look as if they're going to get extended again um, potentially beyond the 15th and 16th of November. The sides are still as far apart as ever when it comes to fishing rights and level playing field. But on the more positive side, the departure of Dominic Cummings could offer, you know, as, as, you know, the departure of Dominic Cummings as the Prime Minister's chief advisor, could offer a ray of hope in terms of maybe some form of compromise um, on the UK side as well as the European Union side. So um, that's helped to support the pound as well over the course of the past few days. Maybe there'll be a change of emphasis there. With respect to the FTSE here, we have seen a little bit of a little bit of a reversal here, but I think as long as we're able to stay above 6,250 and below 6,400, we could have the makings of the beginning of a little bit of a flag or a pennant consolidation um, before the next move, either up. Or down. So if it moves down, it'll be a failed flag. If it moves up, then we could see a move back to 6,600. But the fact that we're above the 200 day moving average and the 50 day is starting to roll higher suggests that maybe we could well be starting to see the beginnings of a significant rebound in the FTSE. Okay, so we talked a little bit about what's gone on over the course of the past um, few days. And by and large, it's been another positive week for stock markets. The big question now is whether or not that can continue as we look ahead to the week ahead. And we've got a host of very, fairly important data coming out this week, starting with the latest Chinese retail sales numbers, which are due out on the Monday, the 16th of November. We've also got US retail sales due out on the 17th of November and UK retail sales on the 20th of November. We've also got the latest UK public finances numbers, which are expected to be um, pretty ugly but the UK is not alone in having um, pretty stretched uh, public finances. Pretty much everyone else has got the old monetary hose pipe on um, in trying to mitigate the effects of the current pandemic. So let's first and foremost start with Chinese retail sales. And these will be the numbers for October. Retail sales growth in China finally appears to be gaining some traction after several months of caution and concerns about a second wave. Um, 
in the last two months, improvements in imports growth, improvement in services PMIs suggest that the loss of confidence as a result of the February lockdown is slowly returning and the lack of a second wave thus far in China um, has prompted a pickup in demand in not only the auto sector, but also in terms of uh, retail spending, raising demand from the likes of Apple in the Chinese markets. Um, and as a result, in, as a result in the last couple of months, we've seen the first solid month of positive retail sales growth um, with a rise of 3.3% in September. That followed a very modest 0.5% gain in August. So the first two positive months this year for retail sales have happened in the last two months. Now, I would expect this to improve further in October, not only because um, consumer confidence and PMIs have been improving, but also because it was the golden week holiday at the beginning of the month from China. And that's likely to have brought out Chinese consumers, um, not in their droves, but certainly I think in um, much greater numbers as we look towards year end and, year end. and obviously in November, we've also had Singles Day um, on the 11th of November. So the, the, the potential for some decent October and November retail sales numbers is likely to remain quite high. Year to date, Chinese retail sales are still down 7.2%, but I expect this to come down um, with respect to um, retail sales in October where expectations are for a rise of 5%, though we could come in higher than that if Golden Week sales prove um, slightly firmer than expected. In the terms of the US dollar, um, the US dollar's had what I would call a little bit of a mixed week. We did have a little bit of a push to the downside, but on Monday, we saw a very, very sharp snapback in the CMC dollar index. Going to remove that um, resistance level there. The fact that we snapped back so strongly and posted a bullish engulfing pattern here, a bullish reversal, suggests that we've potentially seen the bottom in the dollar for the very, very short term. So that level there, I'll just draw a circle around it. There we go. So this green candle here is a bullish reversal. It suggests that we could well see a little bit of a rebound on a breakthrough 980 back towards the levels that we saw um, towards the beginning of the month and this level here that generally tends to be a fairly bullish signal for further dollar gains going forward so what does that mean well it essentially means that euro dollar is going to go lower um, so if we look at euro dollar and i'll quickly quickly bring that chart up there we've once again found that the air is a little bit thin above 120. let me just remove some of these these lines here because i think they're a little bit surplus to requirements let's just move that and move that yeah there we go and do a little bit of analysis while i'm talking but what we what as i say what we can see here is that there is certainly potential for a, a, a move back towards around about 116.12 given the fact that we we're pretty much unable to move back above these highs here and what was important here is we posted a bearish reversal um, which would suggest that as long as we stay below this trend line here bearing in mind we got a bullish reversal on our dollar index the next likely move on any rebound in euro dollar is likely to be back towards these lows around about 116.12 um, it's now become quite apparent that um, Joe Biden will be the next president of the United States and the big question will be what if any sort of fiscal stimulus is likely to come about between now and the end of the month or the end of the year personally i think it's highly unlikely um does that mean the dollar is going to remain strong very very difficult to say i think if we get a little bit of risk off then the dollar could gain from that and by risk off i means weakness in equity markets at the moment um equity markets thus far today as i'm talking to you are looking to end near the top of their weekly range, which is fairly positive. The big question then being how much further can they go? In terms of the retail sales numbers in the US, we've seen very much a V-shaped recovery. 
um, from the big, big decline seen in the first part of the year. We've seen five months of solid gains, and I think it's quite likely that we will see a six month of growth. Um, the big question here, I think, in the face of rising infection rates in the US, the tightening of restrictions in New York and Chicago, whether or not that is the beginning of further rolling tighter restrictions going forward as various state governors, state authorities um, basically bear down on rising infection rates to protect hospital capacity, ICU capacity. The big question is whether or not we will see that manifest itself in weaker November numbers, but certainly in the context of the resilience in the labour market um, with an unemployment rate now at 6.9%, we could well see another gain for retail sales with a gain of 0.6% expected, albeit that's quite a bit lower from the 1.9% gain we saw in September. So looking at euro dollar, we can we can say here that ultimately this range still remains intact. We're pretty much playing 116, 120 on the wide of it, I think, and that's likely to continue to be the case. And let's let's look at let's look at our old friend cable. Um, I've always, you know, for the past few weeks, I've been saying buy the dipping cable, buy the dipping cable. I remain of that view, um, irrespective of all the noise around Brexit talks, EU trade talks and what have you. We are now um, well above the levels that we were a week ago. We've broken above 131.7080. We need to get back above that and push back towards these highs here. But if we look at, if we also look at the CMC Sterling Index, we can see a similar sort of thing playing out here as well. If I just change that font so you can actually see it, um, make sure it's easier to read and get rid of these active pointer lines, we can actually have a much greater idea of where we are in terms of the trend. Now, looking at this oscillator, it's telling you it's a little bit overbought. It's a bit messy, but overall, if a price, if the price is telling me one thing, and the oscillator is telling me something different. I take notice of the price action. The price action is the be all and end all for me. Oscillators, moving averages and what have you are complementary to the overall underlying analysis of the price action. Here, the trend is very much to the upside. Yes, we've seen a little bit of a correction back down from the peaks that we saw earlier this week. Nonetheless, if we do get any further weakness, as long as we stay above this trend line here, and ultimately the bullish scenario, the optimism that I have around sterling is likely to continue to remain. That's certainly borne out by the way Euro sterling has behaved over the course of the past few days. Now, this is a little bit messy, so I will try and clean it up a little bit for you. Let's just close the cable chart and we can look at Euro sterling. So again, this, this blue line, which I talked about last week, this horizontal, this, this sloping trend line from the highs, it's thus far continued to remain intact. More importantly, the 50 and 100 day moving averages have also acted as a little bit of resistance. Now, what's significant here is we broke this trend line here. Personally, it's not as significant as it might be um, because of the extent of the rebound that we saw from the 8860 area. So I'm going to get rid of it. I don't need it anymore. It's surplus to requirements. If we look at this 8860 level here, you can see how crucial this level is. We've tested it on one, two, three, four occasions. What's significant about it is when we rebounded off it, we closed well away from it. So this suggests to me that there's an awful lot of pent up demand down there. There's a, there's a lot of buyers still around that 8860 level. And ultimately, that means that it's going to continue to be a tough nut to crack. But as long as any rebounds stay below this trend line here and the 50 day and 100 day moving average, then the underlying trend remains intact. But this is a warning sign here that potentially we may have seen a short term base. And if we break through here, we could go back to test 91 and a half, 92. At the moment, we're below that. But the fact that we've pushed down so aggressively and then rebounded so aggressively means that sentiment around euro sterling is still very volatile and no one really wants to hold positions significantly large positions one way or the other 
hence the extent of that rebound after we failed to crack 8860. But you know, make no bones about it. 8860 is a big, big level. If we break through that, it's going to trigger stops quite aggressively and we could get a really big move lower. So we really do need to be primed for a potential breakout there. Now, in terms of the actual pound and um, certainly, certainly with respect to what we're looking for going forward, what I would say with respect to um, the pound is it's a big week in terms of the UK economy. Again, public finances, retail sales. The recent extending of furlough by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, to the end of March suggests that we're very much in this for the long haul, vaccine or not. And I think that the fact that the government acknowledges that is, while not particularly pretty for the public finances, it's probably a necessary evil when it comes to supporting the economy and trying to avoid any long term economic damage as we head into 2021. I think the more, most important numbers for me, um, away from the headline number of £200 billion of borrowing so far, with potentially another £35 billion for October, is the retail sales numbers. Because given the fact that we're now locked down in England here, and an awful lot of the rest of the country, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland are in Tier 3 restrictions, or even Tier 4 if you're in Scotland, how the UK consumer goes into year end is going to be a very key determinant of the extent of the bounce back, any bounce back that we see in 2021. So um, UK retail sales been a positive story. We've seen five consecutive months of decent gains since the relaxation of lockdown in the spring. This, however, could be as good as it gets as we head into year end. Now, in September, we saw an increase of one and a half percent. Now, the October numbers could go either way. And why do I say that? Because even though we saw a significant tightening of restrictions throughout the month of October, for example, pubs and restaurants saw their takings down 33 percent. And obviously that will feed into the retail sales numbers. We also saw a pre-lockdown surge at the end of October which prompted the British Retail Consortium Retail Sales Survey to book a 5.2% gain from a year ago. So, you know, depending on how much demand at the end of October was brought forward from November, then we could well see a retail sales number of minus 0.3, minus 0.4, or even it could come in flat. But I'm certainly not expecting a largely positive number. It's likely to be a last hurrah um, before the government decide to unlock the economy sometime before Christmas in December. So um, so that's, that's UK retail sales, not really expecting great shakes there. If it comes in around about zero, I think we'll probably have had a result. Um, so, so, so certainly, certainly, certainly looking at that. Now, in terms of earnings, um, I think it's going to be a big week for a number of companies, Vodafone being a case in point. If we look at Vodafone, we can see here that when they reported it in July, um, the numbers show that the business performed better than expected in the first, in, in the first quarter. And the, the rebound in the share price does appear to have reflected that. We've seen a nice big breakout from this potential base down here, potential double bottom. Um, so you've got 114 to 101, that's around about 13p. That would seem to suggest that this break higher should take out the 200-day moving average and push up towards 130 and these peaks here. The, I think the big question for Vodafone is whether or not their roaming and visitor revenues have started to pick up um, in the wake of the re relaxation of lockdown. Fixed services revenues have also showed some fairly decent gains. Um, I think the big question with respect to Vodafone is because they're taking on the likes of BT and Telefonica, AE02, um, I think there will be a, some hope that the recent decision to add Amazon Prime and YouTube Premium to its mobile entertainment plan on top of Sky Sports TV and Now TV has added quite a few numbers to its bottom line and helped pull the share price back up from um, the levels, pull back up towards the levels that we saw 
in mid-July. So keeping an eye on whether or not that breakout can be sustained. Let's look at EasyJet. Um, we've also seen a breakout in the EasyJet share price over the course of the past few days. Obviously, that's the Monday vaccine news. Um, so that's fairly positive, back above the 200-day moving average. Um, EasyJet have also bolstered their finances in the last month or so by raising um, over a billion pounds um, in terms of leasing back, sailing, selling and leasing back um, a number of its aircraft to bolster its balance sheet. That now looks like a fairly prudent move given the recent COVID news or the recent vaccine news, because essentially what it does is it puts them in a fairly decent position, um, hopefully for when um, it's able to boost its capacity. So another thing is obviously it will help, I think, reduce the cash burn if um, it's able to start lifting, um, lifting lifting restrictions and improving the number of its flights that it does on a daily basis. So above 700p, looking fairly positive, as long as we can stay above that and the 200 day moving average, then we could well see further gains for the EasyJet share price. Obviously rising infection rates aren't gonna help in that regard, but we know that's gonna happen anyway. It's really about what's gonna happen in the first half of next year that I think investors will have their primary focus on. We've also got Royal Mail, what a Lazarus-like comeback we've seen from here, back around, around about 270p after hitting a low of 120p back in March. Now, you may recall all the way back in the day when the Royal Mail IPO'd at 330p. I thought at the time that was a little bit overpriced, but it went all the way up to 600p. So, um, you know, how wrong was I there? But having said that, I always felt the business model was a little bit suspect. And certainly recent events have proved that to be the case. That being said, the outlook for Royal Mail certainly looks an awful lot more positive now than it did a couple of years ago. We've changed CEO, so hopefully industrial relations will be better. And also um, we've we've seen the um, Czech billionaire Daniel Kretinsky take a stake in Royal Mail as well. So that would suggest to me that I think a much more consensual industrial relations policy could actually see these shares continue to move higher. However, I still struggle to see whether or not there's much traction much above 300p. But certainly if we look at the direction of travel here, um, the fact that we've managed to push above 280p and we've got the peak season and various lockdowns and what have you, parcel traffic, Royal Mail should see a significant uptick in parcel traffic as a result of these various lockdowns while, while people stay at home. So hopefully these first half numbers that are due out on the 19th of November should reflect that new reality. EasyJet some numbers, four year numbers are out on the 17th of November, by the way, I forgot, I neglected to mention that um, when I was talking about EasyJet earlier, but that's for all my group. And I'm gonna finish up with Walmart because, um, Obviously, they've just um, they've just agreed a deal to sell Asda, so they should have a nice little windfall of around about six billion pounds, um, boosting their coffers. And they've been another retail success story in the U.S. along with Target, who are also reporting next week. Walmart's Q3 numbers are on the 17th. E-commerce sales have they've been a big winner, as have Target. That's one thing that an awful lot of U.S. retailers have done well. Um, it has realized a $1 billion loss as Walmart on the sale of its Argentina business. But certainly I think even though it's seen a big increase in business costs, it's actually seen a much better increase in e-commerce sales. They increased 97% in Q2, 74% in Q1. So it'll be very interesting to see whether or not they can sustain that sort of um, increase in Q3. Um, just briefly talking about Halfords, first half numbers on the 18th. Again, they've been a big winner from the pandemic in terms of cycling, sale of bicycles, but also in terms of sales of car peripherals, so roof racks um, and um, roof boxes, roof racks as people have stayed at home. 
also sales of batteries, bulbs, wiper blades, and what have you, is more and more people, instead of getting on a plane, got in their cars. So Halfords should see some fairly good numbers as well. So I think that pretty much, um, I think that pretty much brings me more or less um, to, to to the end to the end of this particular um, webinar. So I'm hoping that um, you all found this very useful, ladies and gentlemen. Um, once again, I'd like to thank you very much for your patience and for listening. And I will speak to you all same time, same place next week. In the meantime, I wish you all a very nice weekend and a good week trading. Thanks very much.